I hope there's nothing in my teeth. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Brittany Simon podcast. In today's episode, and thank you again if you're listening on Spotify, we just hit a thousand downloads, which is very exciting for me. In today's um, podcast, I thought we would talk about Rhea and the Last Dragon and trust issues. A lot of you have wanted me to talk about cheating and trust and building trust in dysfunctional or toxic relationships and lifestyles and families. And I've avoided most of these topics lately because I just haven't had a way to really communicate them. But I just saw Rhea with my nephews, first time in a theater. It was the three of us, no one else. It was amazing. Our local theater is open and there was no one on a weekday in the middle of the day to go. So we went and it was beautiful and we had so much fun. Now, Before we jump into all that, I just want to say a few things. One, I really am very excited that we reached 1,000 downloads on Spotify. That's very exciting for me. Two, I bought this outfit at Goodwill because Goodwill is one of my favorite things, favorite things to do is just shopping at thrift stores, but Goodwill in particular, just because I love the idea that this was owned by someone and it's got a long history and I put on this jumper and I was really excited because I usually hate jumpers, but I really like this one. It came with really big shoulder pads and I was really excited about it and then... I put it on and there's a pouch in the front of my abdomen that shouldn't be there, like an excess of cloth. And I sat there for like 30 minutes thinking like, who put this thing on? It's so tight in many places, but so loose right there on the abdomen. And then I was like, oh, is this a maternity jumper? And then I thought to myself, of course it is. Of course, I probably went to Goodwill and shopped in the women's section and just happened to grab a jumper that happened to be for a pregnant lady. And what am I? In my 30s and not pregnant. There's definitely no pain to this joke or comment or story, whatever you want to call this little snippet. But I just thought that was really important that we would just observe (laughs) that the universe let me pick out maternity clothes. I wanted maternity clothes since I was like 12 years old. I knew I was destined to be a mother. I definitely feel like a mother. And next week's episode is all about identity. So please come back for next week's episode. If you're in the middle of an identity crisis, next episode is all about that glory and how you find an identity and who you are in the present instead of who you want to be in the future. Okay, so that's for next week. Now, This week, I wrote some notes down in my text messages as per usual. So let's look that up. If you guys haven't seen Rhea, I'm not going to give any spoilers. I do just want to mention, though, that the dragon, i.e. the lost dragon in the title, so not giving anything away, is um, Sisu, I think is the name of the dragon, is played by Aquafina, And it it has to be the most beautiful, her most iconic role ever. Like Aquafina is one of my favorite humans. I don't know anything about her personally, just her as an actress and her as a human and her in, in terms of energy. Holy shit, I want to I wanna hang out with Aquafina. She's just such a person, and the character they chose for her is just so perfect for her that I absolutely loved it. i um, so glad I went in there not realizing it was her and then heard her voice and went, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so uh, let's see. Reading my notes here. It says, Rhea and trust. What does it mean to trust after being cheated on? How do you learn to trust people after you've been cheated on? How do you trust people after living in toxic environments? Well, it's interesting that we're talking a lot about this because in Raya the Last Dragon, the the I think the main uh, conflict in the film is how to regain, regain trust in humanity, our fellow neighbors. And given that COVID and pandemics are happening, I think a lot of us feel a lot of that strife. How do we trust people that have different ideas of what safety is and how to keep their neighbors safe? <clears throat> Excuse me while I grab a swig of water just a few minutes into this podcast. Mm. I thought about getting one of those uh, football helmets with the straws so I could sip water (laughs) while I did this podcast. Okay, so how do we regain, regain trust in people? Well, first, I think we have to examine who we are and how much do we trust ourselves. I think a lot of the cynicism that we have with the world is a reflection of the cynicism we have in ourselves. I personally have gone through a lot of stages of my life where I definitely identified as a cynic or identified as somebody who was like nihilistic in my early 20s. I've identified with as somebody who was suicidal, somebody who is now not suicidal. I've identified and lived a life as somebody who was suffering from depression when my borderline was, you know, when I was having issues with it. And now that it's gotten so much better, now that I've been almost two years this um, October, December, October, December, like between those two months was really the last of my my um, any issues or triggers. I'm almost on two years now. I realize like my life is a completely different shift than I thought it was before. And my ability to trust people and judge people is clearer, better, more thorough. 
So I think one of the things that I wish I knew known when I was younger that I didn't know until after therapy and all of those things was that, oh, my mental illnesses are incredibly impacting uh, my ability to judge other humans. And I don't mean to say that everyone with a mental illness who suffers from it can't make rational decisions, but I'm telling you it's harder because you're dealing with so many other layers. And now I'm a high functioning person who was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And that's one of the scary ones. So when people hear about it, they really panic. Don't panic. DBT really worked for me. It saved my life. Marshall Lennon hand's brain which is also a dbt i mean a bpd brain <clears throat> right formulated this this therapy that helps people some people needed one session 10 sessions 12 sessions 100 sessions either way even for non-bpd people i think dbt is really helpful because it allows us to take a moment <sighs> breathe and assess the situation clearly by doing our steps and it wasn't until I actually had interviewed and then met a homie over at VidCon, awesome girl, awesome human, awesome person, um, who had told me she was in remission for borderline that I even thought it was possible. So when I sought out answers to get my borderline in check, I sought them out with an understanding that I might not recover. I remember I had made so many videos on borderline talking about how I'm going to assume I'm not one of like the 15% or so that go into remission or whatever word you want to use. I'm going to assume I'm going to be one of the many that are continually suffering <clears throat> from my borderline personality disorder. Now, I had very few sessions of therapy, thousands of dollars, but very few sessions in comparison to some people I know who've been in therapy for five, 10 years. The reason I think it works for me faster and better is not only because of what I had trouble overcoming, right? I was dealing with one mental illness that gave way to symptoms of other ones. So as an example, I didn't have chronic depression. My depression was a, was a reaction to the borderline, right? <clears throat> so once I figured out the borderline, I no longer had the depression, no longer had the suicidal thoughts. My PTSD, once I came into a really clear understanding about my assault and how I wanted to categorize it, the symptoms of PTSD even went away. Do They, they do um, act up on occasion for sure, I definitely have moments where I'm spiraling and so I have to ground myself, but I have steps for that. So I never really go any further. Um, but even, you know, I'm human. We're all human. We have moments where separate from mental illnesses, life gets stressful and piles up and you explode. These things are not the same thing, right? You have to understand what you're suffering from. So a lot of people have a misconception about what they're suffering from and so they can't get help for it. Well, this all ties into how we socialize with other people and how we comprehend how we can trust people. I've been betrayed countless times by women, more women than men. Absolutely. Women went straight for my reputation, lied about who I was, pulled the victim card. Women have been awful to me, but overall, I still trust and love women. And I'm so excited to, you know, you know, understand that 70% of my audience is women. Also, 40% of you are not subscribed to me. So if you guys want to subscribe, you know, I'd really like to make this podcast happen. And I'd like your help doing it. I think the discussions we're having are important and have been incredibly helpful to all of us, myself included. <clears throat> So over my life, right, if I when I was in a panic, I think I, I there was a time in my life when I would say, like, I don't trust women. When I got older, I had been hurt by men, right, assaulted by men and, you know, in conflict with men. And then I was like, you know, I don't think I trust men. And then I realized, oh, Brittany, it seems like you don't trust humans. And I understand people have different gender identifications. But for this sake of this conversation, we're talking about the fact that there are men and women in the world. And for the most part, that's what's made up all of our understanding of humanity. And overall, I have had bad instances with all of them. And yes, if you want to count non-binary people in this conversation, I've also had bad instances with some of you. So good news, we're all equally bad <laughs> or all equally human. I prefer to do this. Humans are going to human, right? That's the slogan here on this channel. Humans are going to human. So we're going to have moments in our understanding of each other that's going to be in conflict with what we know. Hold on. Oh my gosh, I've got a hair on my face. It's driving me crazy. Okay. So in Ray of the Last Dragon, there's this conflict, this moment where two women have a misunderstanding, if you will, or rather a uh, um, um, an understanding that needs to change later on. So as you're watching the conflict build over time, right, you're having those moments of, oh, at least for me, Brittany, I'm old enough to have been able to identify with this conflict, meeting somebody, becoming friends instantly, and then having a moment of, oh, can we even trust each other? That's happened to me a lot with women. And I think it's because women in particular, we bond very quickly. I know we can make fun of men, but I think it's a skill as well to be able to just meet someone at a park and be like, yo, bro, you want to throw a fuck football? Yeah, bro, I do want to throw a football. Oh my God, we're friends. That's dope. But men also say, my drinking buddies, my hockey buddies, my this buddy, my this. Women do that too. But I think there's a, a falsehood in our media, including in modern feminism that says all women are we're our buddies. Nope. Sorry, ladies. All of you are not my buddy. <laughs> like, 
I think it's been made perfectly clear that uh, all women are not each other's buddies, right? And so instead, I think it's reasonable to say people who share values or at least see the world in a very similar way or at least, you know, can move in a similar direction. Maybe those are my people. Maybe those are my buddies. And I I know as somebody who, I'm not going to lie, who has had past interactions with feminists, who in my head, you know, I tell people I don't spill nobody's secrets. And I had a moment of catharticism, I guess, this last two weeks because somebody like somebody got a taste of like their own medicine, right? Something that I feel like I look at them and I'm like, yeah, dude, that's, but you know what's so funny is they didn't even learn the lesson from it. I think that was like the funniest thing is watching her spiral because she's being canceled or whatever. Like she didn't even learn the lesson from it. And it's so hilarious because some people are just such number twos and they live in their own bubbles and they never leave them. So how, how do I look at this woman, right? And think to myself, like, could I ever trust her again? Probably not, but I would trust her enough to forgive her for being a human and then I would offer her a kindness that I think isn't de- shouldn't be denied to her. Same with every girl in my past who's betrayed me. Every girl who's falsely accused me because they didn't they weren't ready to come out, or anyone who's told lies about me. Like I'm I'm no longer angry at you. I don't trust you, and I don't want you in my circles. But I also would offer you a piece of bread if you were starving because bitch I ain't that mad you know like I was never that mad you know I thought I was when I was younger I was just like fuck these girls I hope they die like how dare they and now as I'm older I'm like I just feel sorry which I don't think is better I don't know I guess I'm trying to come to terms with the fact that I guess I feel pity like they must be in a really bad place to be that miserable of a person but I don't think that's really what they want either right they or maybe they do maybe they need to understand that you got to be in a really shitty place or at least I assume so to do something so shitty as what people have done to me but then I realize like maybe not I don't know I guess I struggle but again I'm not going to stereotype every woman like this I'm going to learn to trust people the way I need to trust them funny enough my sister-in-law also saw the film um her and my brother had their six-year anniversary so they went the day before I took the kids and I love doing Auntie Brittany field trips they're my favorite I love taking my nephew's places. I actually just got to babysit all three kids the other day, including the baby, which was just so much fun because she's just a hoot and a half. And she's such a rebel. Like you watch, if you watch Rhea, the baby in Rhea is my niece in my head. I'm like, oh yeah. Even the boys were like, oh, that's blah, blah, blah. And I was like, that is blah, blah, blah. Like, oh my gosh. So exciting to watch babies grow. They have such personalities from a young age. Even siblings are learning to trust each other, right? And they, they have moments of even amongst my own siblings, like distrust, trust, distrust, trust. You have to learn to rebuild over time. You don't get to just trust people because they're family. You have to earn that trust even in families. You're more lenient with family, maybe more forgiving with family. But I mean, that's how it's supposed to be, right? There are initial tribe. We're given a tribe when we're born, which is kind of amazing. And also kind of not amazing when you're maybe a, a solo person. You maybe don't have a tribe when you're born. You're maybe... um abandoned in some way whatever you know word works for your lifestyle or like your story but then we have to do chosen family and so chosen family comes from a place of trust as well I know when I left and I was fighting with my family and especially 2012 and I left to Seattle I was looking for my chosen family people I could choose and I chose my BDSM family and over time it's becoming abundantly clear that like the reason my inner circle is mostly family is because ultimately I was given a tribe that tried its hardest to stay together even though we thought we weren't going to. And so I learned to trust people again because I saw people change and I learned to trust my family again. And it started with trusting myself again. In 2012, between 2012 and 2016, when I was suffering from the height of my borderline, I was in a five-year relationship with somebody that was not good at all. Like it just was not working. And as much as like I wanted it to work and I worked to make it work. Um, it just wasn't going to. And a big part of that is because we could never rebuild the trust that was broken. And so sometimes I think that's, that's something that we forget to pay attention to is that how do you know when to trust someone again, when you can actually rebuild that trust? When do you know not to trust someone when you can't rebuild the trust, but you actually have to try. And that's the scary part is like in order to rebuild trust that's been broken, you have to actually try. So when I was first cheated on and it broke me. I thought I was done, but I wasn't. I needed to see that relationship to the end. So I went back to see if I could see it to the end. And I did. And though I regret a lot of the ways that I handled that situation, I'd also freed me from that relationship. And now I'm not mad that he was the person he was. I just accept it and I moved on with my life. 
I'm dating again. I'm talking to people. I'm happy. Like I'm very excited. I'm very hopeful. I, I don't have that bitterness. When I first when I first left after I was cheated on, I made a lot of YouTube videos like, fuck that. Don't need that noise. I'm a woman. Don't need no man. And it was half true. It was like I felt it, but I didn't feel it. I was something was missing, which is why I went back. Because honestly, I wasn't ready to let go. Even if even if somebody cheated on me, which just told me where I was, I allowed someone to cheat on me and I took them back. I became trash. And I became trash because I was in love, but the only reason it was trash was because I didn't have the wisdom to see that it wasn't one of those relationships where you get back together and it's fine. Like I'm not Beyonce and Jay-Z, right? Because it kills me watching like Cardi and all these women get cheated on. It kills me that they go back. But I don't know, like maybe somebody gets to be Beyonce and Jay-Z because it looks like they made their relationship work, I think in part because Jay-Z completely was wrong and he knew it. I mean, he, I mean, he, I mean, he did all of like, he just, he allowed Beyonce to do what Beyonce had to do to get through that cheating. Um, my partner didn't. My ex-partner didn't like how I reacted to his cheating. He did not like my healing process, which, which, which was very much listening to Lemonade and listening to Cardi talk about being cheated on. And Nikki and like all these people, all these women who like have stories and like I just wonder, right? Like we wonder how do we come to terms with betrayal some people just like figure it's a part of the life some people never look back some people give it a chance ultimately it has to be up to you but I know for me never again like I'm never going to tolerate it because it's not my values I've never cheated never had the desire to cheat never wanted to cheat never even thought about cheating when I'm in love I really don't even notice other people I'm pretty monogamous that way um I can be poly absolutely but I've chosen to be monogamous because I'm naturally monogamous. Like I'm a person who just, I don't experience jealousy, which is why I was good at poly, but I am possessive. I love my partners. When I, when I marry somebody, I want to marry them for life and just not care about anyone else. I want permission to literally never romantically care about anyone else. And I think that is something that is, is not for everyone, to be honest. And I and I do think that there are just some humans out there and that's why you find so, so many large crowds of men and women talking about how men will always cheat or women will always look at other men or someone's always looking for something better because I think that's their lived experience. But see, I grew up with a relationship in my life like my parents who, that are healthy, been together 30 years plus, have 10 kids, you know, all their kids are grown and doing their own thing. Everyone turned out pretty great, you know, even with all of our struggles their kids are all generally good people, give or take, but like it is one of those things, right? Where I have an, a, living, a living example of a healthy relationship, something that grew to be stronger. And on top of that, I have parents that went from saying they were going to kick out and ban their gay kids to making sure we're invited to everything and loved and, and seen and treated as an equal, which means my parents aren't going to come to my wedding if I marry a girl the same way my parents wouldn't go to a non-Catholic wedding because they don't go to non-Catholic weddings. So I am now being treated like the other siblings. <sighs> and I love it. And that in my family is what it means to be treated like everyone else is to have everyone, excuse me, live by their values um, and not by yours. So, you know, I don't expect my mom to live by my values. I expect her to live by hers. And then we find a relationship that matches. My mom asks me all the time, when are you going to come back to the Catholic church? When are you going to stop being a heathen on the internet? And I'm like, probably never mom. And I always remind her that like, you know, girl, it's just how it is. And my mom has found a way to make peace with it. I don't know how, probably through God, <laughs> to be honest, because it must be difficult to be fearful all the time that like maybe my daughter's not making reasonable decisions. I mean, I worry about girls all the time when girls come to me and they say, I want to do OnlyFans or I want to do adult work. I'm always worried for them because most of the people who get into this industry are not good at it and they don't like it. They feel like they're always surviving. And I'm telling you right now, I'm a thriving girl. I love it. P.S. Join my OnlyFans. I just put out the most me video I have ever made in my whole life. And I wept when I saw it. It was just like, yes, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> so I bought more lights. I'm ready to make more videos like you all like girls or boys. Like I don't care if you like my only fans is definitely like erotic videos, more or less like it's not really like porn. It's like you watch it, but you don't even think about masturbating. You think about like eating popcorn. Will you judge the silhouette of my naked body? So I love it. 
I would love to eventually, you know, be known for a specific style or create something through this work, but it's taken me such a long time. And this is why next week's podcast is going to be so good at identity because I have so many things to say about how long it took me to figure out my work identity, my sex identity, my woman identity, everything. And there's such a trial to it. So, okay, how do we build trust with people? Oh my gosh, again, this all goes down to our perception. How did I need so few sessions of therapy? Well, I was really well read. That super helps. I'm not going to lie. I forget, even though I can't cite everything I've read, I've got 2,000 books worth of knowledge just sitting in my head somewhere. And it's in my subconscious. My subconscious has it in our backup, you know, freaking memory card. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's something going on in my brain that other people might not have. And I think that's a huge advantage. A lot of the people that I know who reach level five, if you guys don't know, I have an observational th- philosophy links down below. Check it out. It's the pinned video on the homepage uh, that represents categories of humans who acknowledge like their, how much they can acknowledge their own existence and to what level. And fives, like, you know what I mean? There is a, an awareness in order to become a five that you have to have that stems from this idea of what it means to trust people and how and how you observe them. But it also comes from a skill set. So most fives I know are well read. Most fives I know are well traveled or at least have interacted with a lot of different cultures. That's really important. And they've risked their lives and they put themselves in dangerous situations to understand themselves and people more than being victims of their life or rather even if they have been victims because I do think there needs to be an element of like a really lived childhood involved here to be a five um they they do they just have a lot of information to use therapy what is it right what is a therapist it's a person who's read a lot of books who's trained themselves in the in um the human mind right all of us could be t- self-taught therapists if we actually read all the curriculum and did studies and actually followed the formula of learning the what it means to be a therapist, right? I believe this. I know a lot of people are probably upset. I know you went to college. God bless you. I'm glad you did. But let's be honest, right? Most of the world ain't going to college. So most of the world still has to learn to be functional and we most certainly can do it by being self-taught. Okay? So all of this information allows you to observe a, a, a situation that allows you to clearly process what's happening and therefore build trust in a situation where previously without this knowledge you might have had an on like a reactionary distrust. We are back again. Okay, we just took a really quick break because I had to put more aquaphor in my face. My skin is dry as hell. Also, behind me it is snowing. <laughs> so I am in a tropical jumpsuit while it snows. Mm. I really love where I live. It really is paradise for seasons gorgeous views, high-speed internet. Thank God we just like updated everything. Oh my gosh. I really, really realized there's, um, there's something very, uh, (laughs) insane or not insane, but like in order for me to do my job, I need the internet, but for me to live my best life, I want to be disconnected from the internet. Guys, it's a struggle, but the truth is I really do love this job. I really love talking to you. Thank you again for listening on Spotify. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for making this possible. I really, really, really am so excited for next week's show, guys. I have a huge reveal coming. I feel so, I just had the biggest epiphany of my life. Please come to next week's show. I'm working really hard to make it fun. I don't want to like oversell it, but I'm so excited about it. So please, please, please be there. Um, and wish me the best of luck to just get all my energy together because your girl getting old and I don't have the same energy I did before, but I'm about to push like I'm 21 again. Okay, so <sighs> building trust. You know, my life has been really blessed. Uh, and I mean that in the most atheistic way. But my life has been really, really wonderful in the last 12 months. Just a lot of really hard moments that gave me a re- like the wisdom I needed to push myself forward. The last few weeks have been, I think, the end of it in so many ways. Like I can feel it coming where I'm like, oh my God, the end of this chapter is coming and I'm so ready for it. God bless the universe. Like goddess, bless us all. And it had to come from a place of struggle. Like it had to come from a place of pain. And a, a place of uh, what is trust. I had one of these moments, guys, where my where I can't talk about it in detail because I'm just not ready to talk about it in the public. But something happened where I had another moment where I looked myself in a mirror and I said, holy fucking shit, Brittany. How delusional were you in your 20s? And I had a moment where something else from my past came up and I realized I had assessed the situation incorrectly 
And it's like, holy shit. Like, you know, you just learn lessons at different times in your life. And so I learned this really great lesson that I'm so excited I learned, quote unquote, very young. And also, um, I wish I had learned it earlier, but I also, I'm glad it happened now. So anyways, I learned this really great lesson about knowing uh, what's in front of me. It is so easy to assume that we can trust our own gut or our own knowledge. And though I believe your life gives you a proper formed gut, you also need a lived life to form it. And that's where knowing what you're observing comes in. You ever meet a white lady who sees a black person and cannot tell the difference between a person who's dangerous and a black person who's dressed in a way that her brain processes as dangerous? We call this like basic racism. But I also want to just always make sure on this channel we're recognizing that there's this biological um, evolutionary desire we have to be afraid of things or reaction we have to be afraid of things that are unlike us and then there's an inherent cultural bias that comes in through taught racism okay so what is racism it is a fear of it's like a it's experiencing an unnecessary understanding of the other and I think that a lot of people need to recognize that some people do have bad interactions with black people women men anybody and they form bad memories so how do you go in and, and fight that that um that bias and therefore reforming your gut, you have to interact with more people than just the people you know. And that's why I say a well-traveled person reaches inner peace or joy or enlightenment or whatever woo-woo word you want to use. Uh, in order to reach level five, you have to be able to tell yourself, okay, there's 8 billion people. And though in my head right now with the limited information I have, I feel like I'm reasonable when I say gay people might be molesters because three out of the four gay people I know have molested children, right? Which is a true story for a lot of people. And I know you don't want to admit it. I know you say it hurts your political movements. But if we do not first acknowledge that everyone only has the knowledge they have and therefore can live in a world, a bubble, where black people are the only been the only mean people to them, or white people have only been the only mean people to them, or queer people or any of these people have only ever been the enemy, then yeah, they're going to have that information. So you have to go out and if you have the more knowledge, if you are no more knowledgeable, you have to be the bigger person and go out and reform other people's guts almost for them, but not really. So you have to go out and be that image and then they have to do the work of reforming their own gut. So think about how this is a twofold. When people ask me how my community member, this is how my community member, by making sure my community knows I'm trustworthy, by being trustworthy, not by deceiving them, but by actually being a good neighbor, okay? And then making sure that they know who I am. The person who helped you today, that's a Middle Eastern woman. The person who helped you today, that's a queer woman. The person who helped you today, but not in an obnoxious way and never at first. I always add it in little at a time when they're ready to hear it. When they know that who I am as a person isn't defined by these details, but the character, the, the, who I am as a character, like my values. But the thing is, is that in politics, we've attribu like attributed whether you're on the left or the right or whatever, we've attributed transness to being good automatically. Blackness to being good automatically because we're trying so hard to protect our communities without understanding that transness or blackness doesn't define you as good or bad. It's just, it's just what it is. And so the dilemma I think we're all having is what we're all trying to communicate because in Raya and the Dragon, The Last Dragon, the, the story only covers trust in a very superficial manner. You know, how do we get all of our communities to trust us again? How do we come together as a community? How do we know that the other one isn't going to betray us? And at the end of the movie, of course, they all like find a way to make it work because this is Disney. But the thing that's so funny, right? And that's not a spoiler. You know, that's going to happen. It's a Disney movie. Everyone's got to end up happy is as I was watching the end of this movie and I'm like, oh, look, all of humanity coming together because they all decided they're going to be good when it comes to this one issue. So are none of these people rapists or pedophiles or any really bad people? I guess not. And that's the thing. We are. In a Disney movie, everyone can come together and make a harmonious world because it's not real. Because the magic of Disney is letting us use metaphors for something really big to handle something really small. What Disney's whole premise of this movie is when it comes to trust is can you trust your community long enough to not attack each other to have a conversation? And right now, yes and no. Some of us are doing it. Some of us aren't. You know, my homie the other day who asked me, who told me, wow, Bernie, I thought you'd be more like, I thought you'd care more about the world than, than just yourself. You know, it's not a person who volunteers their time or goes out or knows their neighbors. It's a shut-in. And that's the problem. Most of us feel really good about just saying things out loud. 
And when it comes to trust, sometimes we are in denial and deceive ourselves into thinking, I trust this person because they said the words I wanted to hear versus um, follow through the actions I I knew to trust or could learn to could observe and learn to trust. And so I think it's just very human and I'm not mad at any of it. I think it all makes sense. It makes sense about why I did it. Like I can't beat up the world for something I did because I know why I did it. And in the time it made sense, like I've put my trust in so many other people because for me, it's like trust first, you know, feel betrayed later. But for some people, it's earn my trust first and and then we can, you know, so you never betray me. I just feel like I'm never going to be a person who loves truly or is authentically a friend unless I get vulnerable first. So I'm always willing to take the hit first. I will be vulnerable with people in order to build a friendship or relationship that I think is good. Now, the only difference between my earlier years and my later years and how I how I debated or figured out how to trust people or not trust people was in the frequency of course (laughs) so when I was younger I was really cynical and didn't trust anybody had walls up that were really intense so then I never was vulnerable and I never fell in love then I decided okay in order to fall in love I have to tear down my walls and be willing to do that I did that I put my all into a relationship and then I got cheated on But then in hindsight, I realized why I got cheated on, why things happened the way they did. And the person that I was dating, how everything they did up until that time made sense that they cheated. You know, I used to believe that I had dated somebody who would never cheat on me. So when I heard it, it was so devastating. But after therapy, I realized, oh, he was dropping hints he was going to cheat day one. And I just never, I wasn't willing to be honest with myself about it because I kept believing no this is a good person they were introduced to me by a friend who's a good person this is a good person I actually did that because I was introduced to my ex-partner by somebody I trusted I thought they would have vetted him the way I would have vetted him but they didn't so I let them in very quick he was in a relationship at the time and Polly I let them into my life very quick I tore down my walls so heavily for them and so I was in love like I was in love you know I was doing this thing because I wanted it so badly But I also realized as I got older is, okay, now that I've had both the super cynicism and my walls are up and I'm not going to give away my feelings all the way to I've given away everything, I'm pulling back, recollecting my stones and putting up a fence, not a wall, not six feet, just a nice picket fence. It signifies to the world, I am open, but I have boundaries. I am open, but I have boundaries. Say it with me, people with trust issues. I am open, but I have boundaries. And now in order to understand your boundaries, you have to understand your goals. So next stage, ding, 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 ding. What are our boundaries? This took me a very long time to figure out. Super, super, super long to figure out. Also, I just spit on my mic. Oh my God, I am a heathen. This took me forever to figure out. Okay, so I've now got this picket fence. I'm chilling. I'm enjoying my life. I let people come over. They go, oh, hey, Brittany. And I go, oh, hey, Truman. And they go, hey, I'd really like to date you. And I go, "Mm, I don't know. Do we see the world the same way? And then we have that conversation. And then if they do, or maybe they do halfway, I let them in the fence maybe. Or maybe I come over to the fence and we just start a conversation. Maybe we exchange phone numbers. I don't know. It's really going to depend on my mood that day, who I want to let into my bubble and how well I've assessed them. Now, okay, this is the place I call now is neither cynicism nor is it overindulgence. I think the place I call the place I am now is just balanced, right? That's always my goal is just to find balance. Just like an avatar, the less airbender at Aang when his chakra was blocked because of Katara, he has to let go of the things he loves in order to get to the place he needs to be to protect the people he loves. Which is interesting because all of that comes down to trust. Does Aang trust Katara to take care of herself? Does Katara trust Aang to let go of her in order to do his job? It's like, do we trust the people in our lives to do what they need to do? I tried to baby and protect my last partner um, because he was in every way uh, like a child. He just was. He exhibited nothing that was... Um, a true marker of an adult. But the dilemma is, is that he matches in his age group the expectation of an adult in this current day and age. But from my perspective, in my culture, my perspective, he doesn't have adult. He's not an adult. So one of the things that was sort of interesting about dating in my 20s was that I dated people who were as fucked up as I was, but I kept dating them even though I got better. 
What I learned later on was like now where I am at my stage here, I can't be there for somebody who's still trying to figure out like their identity, right? Because I've already, I'm solidified in mine. And it ha- when it happens, it feels like a Pikachu um, evolved. It feels like, you know, you're a Pokemon and you've evolved and it's like, it is what it is. Like you can't go back. It happens when it happens. And when it happens, it's important, but it means you can leave people behind. It's why in marriages, it's really important that you grow with your partner throughout your years because if you don't, you can grow apart, right? That's what growing apart means. It doesn't always mean, um, you know, people are um, evil for it. Sometimes it happens naturally. But, you know, it is preventable if people put in the work. It's why I don't believe in the one. I believe marriage is something you choose and you choose it every day. And you can fall in love like, oh, my gosh. <sighs> I cried so much during Raya, but before Raya, there was a short, you know how they do the little shorts. There was a movie short um, before the movie of this dancing couple. And I cried. I cried my eyes out. It was so romantically adorable. And it's just, you know, I love the idea of growing old with someone. It's so romantic and I want it more than I want anything. But that means I have to trust somebody who's had a completely different life than me decades alone without me ever knowing me. I have to trust them to come into my life and start a new life together, like a really new life. Like whatever path we were on before can't be the same path. It has to be a new path with us together because there was no way for us to have considered the other in our current day because the other didn't exist to us until they did, right? So now as I date and now as I go forward, it's a matter of finding somebody who's like, they see me, we're both on a train track, our trains are going in a direction, we see each other, we link up for a time, and then we have to decide if we're going to hop onto our own track and start our own journey together. And that's what we're doing. <clears throat> and how do we get there? We get there by using the information we've gained over our lives, i.e. wisdom, to make better decisions. And ultimately, that's what this comes down to is, do you have the wisdom to make better decisions? Or do you notice you're making the same mistakes? One of the things my therapist gave me as a tool that completely changed my life was keeping a sh- uh, keeping a shorthand journal. <clears throat> yes, keeping long form journals are great. I've got tons of them. My mom has like literally hundreds where like you can write about, you know, in detail your whole day. But one of the things my therapist would have me do, <coughs> excuse me, is she would have me take a journal and say, okay, today is uh, Tuesday. So I'm, yes, I'm filming this on Tuesday. This will come out tomorrow. But today is Tuesday. Um, Today was a great day. It snowed. Um, Had coffee. uh, Good energy. Hope to keep it up tomorrow. The next day. uh, Today was kind of lame. I cried. I'm tired today. Uh, Maybe tomorrow. The idea of it is to be able to see if there's a pattern in behavior. So what I've noticed is when I went back and checked my journals, I did notice that the pattern of my triggers, my anxiety, my issues uh, came from interacting with people who conflicted with my reality. So one of the baby steps I had to take to recovering my borderline was being able to interact with people who shared my reality. The earth is round. There's no God. Queer people are great. uh, Trans people are great. You know, like stuff like that, right? Versus maybe interacting with people who are like the earth is flat and trying to have a conversation with them, it would just like drive me crazy. Now, I know how to engage completely. I just literally jump into their reality with them. So when I talk to a flat earther now, I don't talk to them like I'm not a flat earther. I jump in with them and I go, whoa, yeah, so the earth is flat. What's that about? And then I try to decipher if in the middle of this conversation, I can understand their logic enough to have a conversation with them. Because I think one of the issues I had before was that I couldn't speak people's languages, so I couldn't trust them. I couldn't speak people's languages because I didn't, I don't believe what they believe. And so I was like dismissive, like, but now I can dive in there and be like, okay, I'm going to try to talk to you like I'm in this reality with you and try to see if we can decipher some of the loopholes in our own lives. I mean, we know as secularists, or I know as a secularist, as somebody who doesn't believe in a supernatural being without, you know, I mean, open to change, Avi, you know, facts change my life. But, you know, as of right now, I have no empirical evidence, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so I know, hold on, my train of thought is leaving me. I know that I believe this. Okay, I the original thought left me, so I'm going to go with this one. I know, I know what I believe. And I know why I believe it. 
And I feel like I've traced it back. So when I interact with these people, I can jump into their world now and it can be a really safe space for me and not triggering because I know ultimately it's it's as if you're talking to, forgive me, a child and you're just going along with their imagination because honestly, that's ultimately what we're all doing is we're all kind of playing pretend in our worlds and we're trying to understand the other person's game of like, what's your pretend? Because ultimately, I do believe we're evolved animals on earth and I believe our intellect gives us this narcissism this ego that makes us believe that our lives aren't our dreams like you know how Americans say like oh I wish I could just live my dream life but like you literally can most of the time like I know some people can't ever but statistically most people have enough access to YouTube to Google to all of these things to build a life for them if they can build it because like I know for me My life now was impossible before YouTube and OnlyFans, but my life is now possible and now I'm going to grasp it. This is a dream of mine to be able to talk to people and have, I thought I was going to be a talk radio host, guys. I thought I was going to be on TV. Fuck that noise. I'm on YouTube. How could I give that up? And I'm going to do it in a way that matches my values. I have a Patreon. Like I don't even need sponsors. Like I have a Patreon. And then if I get sponsors, let's get some cool sponsors. Like I'm really on the search for really specific sponsors, people who I align with my values in their companies, people that are chill, people that are creating good things, but I don't need them. I'm not reliant on selling out because I live a humble life. Now, if I wanted a million dollar mansion, yeah, I would have to sell out, but I don't. My needs are simple. I just need a small house, a little farmhouse with like as many acres as I can buy within my budget and um, enough money to support my kids. And I want to live in a normal neighborhood. I do not want to live with like super wealthy people at all. I want to live with normal people because I feel like a normal person and therefore my needs are are nowhere near somebody who needs some more cash and so they have to do things. That's what I'm saying. Like you can live within your values, okay? And when you live within your values, you become a trustworthy person because you become a person people can rely on to be this kind of person. And then if everyone was doing that, right, we would all be people who lived within our values and were consistent and people could rely on us to be those people. But the problem is, is that all of us are always at different stages in our life. And some of us have been untrustworthy people or some of us have been people like who can't live within their values for whatever reason. And so we're not always going to have a harmonious existence. We just have to create it where we can in our bubbles. And it's not going to be for everybody. You know, I like to live a very community but solitude life. I love my neighbors. I'm glad I know my neighbors. I'm glad they know who I am. I'm also glad they only text me once a week or twice a week or three times a week or that we only see each other when we see each other, which is every day, but we don't hang out every day. We see each other, we wave hi, but we don't interact long 15 minute, 20 minute conversations, um, you know, at most. And that's easy. But then there comes the joy of reaching out and saying, hey, today let's have a community day. Thank you for giving me space throughout the week where we had limited interaction. But now I think I'd like maybe two hours with you, maybe a barbecue. Let's eat together. These are very different experiences that have formed over months now, a year plus of building trust. You know, the other day, my neighbor um, let me know that she Notice my spider webs were getting out of control, which is true. We have huge spiders where I live and the cobwebs just get out of control. And so I have to keep up with them. It's annoying. It's like mowing the lawn, only I'm mowing the spider webs. And so I just have to take care of the spider webs. And I had to get a broom and it was like a big pain in the butt, but I did it because the store was out of the broom I wanted. I live in a small town, which means I had to order a broom and then I couldn't find one. Then Marcus got me a broom. Anyways, found what I needed. I'm a very short person, short people life struggles. Anyways, she reached out. She let me know they were getting out of hand. And again, don't take offense. I understand. I live in an HOA neighborhood. They have an expectation of the look. I moved here so I could live in a neighborhood that had a restrictive look. So I knew there would be a standard of like beauty, right? And so, yeah, okay. Clean the spider webs off. Didn't even worry about it. But I know for a fact that there are people who would get upset about that, who would get angry. But see, I thought this was a trust moment. My neighbor trusted that I would not get upset at her for expressing her authentic views in a very kind way. And I trust her um, enough to understand that I, to trust, I trust her enough to trust me to know that I'm not doing it maliciously, to know that I, oops, forgot I was doing work. I'm so sorry. I'll get to them right now. Right. And I, and I try to do it the same day that I get the complaint so people know, um, I'm not ignoring them and I'm not trying to be petty. I'm so sorry that I didn't notice that. I'll get it done. I don't mind because that's just them helping me out. I know for a fact my neighbor is not sitting there going, ugh, Brittany didn't clean her cobwebs. I'm just going to give her a call. 
Oh, Brittany, did you know your cobwebs are disgust? Like, that's not how she's talking. She's like this. Oh, no. I noticed that the spider webs are building up. And you know what? Ooh, the spiders are building nests. I really don't want a spider infestation. You know, our houses are connected. I'll let her know her spider webs are growing because maybe she didn't notice them, which is like basically what goes on, right? You just don't notice. Oh, yeah, the spiders came back. They've made new webs. And we don't want spiders. I don't want spiders either. I don't want an infestation of spiders. So her reaching out to me is her trusting me. And me trusting her to be able to communicate with each other without there being a judgment or pettiness or pain. What a beautiful, blessed life. Like, what a beautiful, blessed life. Oh, I got to check the time, by the way. Okay. So, time checked. We're good. How are we doing with where I'm at, guys? Okay. I feel pretty confident with how I've communicated with you. Let me think of different examples I wanted to use. I didn't make many other notes other than what I made. And I feel like I've, we've had a pretty good conversation about it. Okay, I think we're ready to skip on to part three. Okay, part three. So con- consumption, what we're consuming informs us. The other day, somebody uh, had a conversation with me and I need this to be clear that if I, you are the person I'm talking about, right? If I ever share conversations I'm having with you guys, I am not using it as a way to attack you or subtweet about you or any of that, right? Reach out to me privately if you want. It's just me finding it interesting and using it as an opportunity to share with everyone else how these real human interactions are having are happening. So I talked to somebody the other day and we were talking about dressing babies up in clothes that say things like um, handsome as boy, lady killer, gonna get them all, you know, stuff like that. And they were talking about how it's like sexualizes babies. And I've had talks like this with dozens of dozens of people and it's not something that often gets talked about by many people but I've noticed it comes from usually women young people um queer people non-binary people people who are usually under the age of 20 and when they have these conversations with me they are usually also people who have had maybe a history of some sort of uh personal sexual abuse And so it becomes personal. And I think that's reasonable. I think it makes sense that from their perspective, any sexualization of a child could feel a little bit like something they've experienced in their past. Interestingly enough, though, I explained to the and I always use the same argument when I explain this is that in my culture, we acknowledge that we are mothers or fathers or parents or people who have offspring that we hope move on to be the best version of them. And we know ultimately most humans mate have children and carry on a lineage. And we want that to be a healthy, wonderful prospect. We like the idea that we've raised boys and girls that are someone to be proud of versus somebody that maybe wouldn't raise their kid with that intent. And I think it's apparent that a lot of parents don't raise their kids with the understanding that this is, a, this is somebody who's going to impact society even as a neighbor. So for me, when I read like clothes that say like, ooh, he gonna be a lady killer. Or when I look at my nephews, I'm like, look at this handsome boy. You're gonna get all the ladies, right? What I mean to say is you're gonna be somebody who's so goddamn respectful, such a man, such a put together human that everyone's gonna, everyone's going to respect you enough to want you to be with their daughters. Because remember, if we had pride in who we were raising, then we would have pride in who our kids were dating. One of the reasons I take my partners home to my parents is because my parents have pride in who's in the family. And when you're in the family, you're in the inner circle. So we're going to be there for you financially, uh, emotionally, as much as we can. If you're down and out, we're going to be there. So if you're asking us to pull our resources to invite you into our family that's loyal to the T, you better be somebody that understands what you're getting into, right? And it's important to us like that we're always there for family. I mean, how many times do I just like tell you guys, sorry, I have to go fly to the state and go get my friend or sorry, I have to leave the state and go get my family or I'm sorry, I have to go like, you know, I will do that. I will I will literally just like pick up and go if someone needs me. That's like my job in the family because I have the most mobility. And it's not like these things get like sat down and assigned. It's just that it's we play to our natural strengths. So this is my natural strength, you know? And again, it's like unsaid rules in a family of this is just like what we do, but you have to form it healthily. So I always put down boundaries. That's how I form this, this healthy. And then of course, on top of that, I read and found different units that worked for different people. So what I noticed is when I read about the mafia, if you read a Mario Puzo book, highly recommend, wonderful author, just reading The Godfather, contemplating the idea of being Michael, somebody who left the family knowing it was organized crime, went on to be a normal person, got sucked back into the family because that's what happens. And then, of course, brings in his vanilla non-mafia girlfriend, let's call it that, back into the family and then makes her a part of it because that's what happens, right? 
It's interesting and highly recommend the, recommend the movies as well if you haven't seen them just because I love slow cinema. I love old school cinema where they'll, they'll just have you watching them eat for like five minutes and they'll have you just like enjoy the sounds of them eating in silence. It's just really beautiful. He- heavily recommend um, the, the quietness of some films is just so good. Anyways, I think about that um, and where that comes from. Like what makes a person want to be a part of a mafia, right? You think to yourself, what makes a person want to be a part of a gang? loyalty friendship consistency community wealth it's this idea that we're all looking for this tribe so what do we do when we're looking for the wrong chosen family or in the wrong chosen family what do we do when our family um is maybe toxic we build with each person as individuals to make a collective that's good so usually in politics we try to help the collective by sub you know putting them in subcategories uh by race or gender or age or whatever else I think it's more personality type. So for me and my family, if there's an issue with one person in the family, we all try within our strengths to best help that person. But it's not one way. We all try our own way. And then we try to figure out what works for that person. Because, you know, you're dealing with so many different emotions and feelings. It's kind of hard. But being there for people sometimes means also backing off. So this is where boundaries come back in. Boundaries allows them space and you space you should encourage your family to go move away take time away from the family go on an adventure cut yourself off go on your adventure and then come back there's so there's so much to leaving the nest and coming back that is so important and um I don't know that people understand it because it sounds scary like why would my kid go out there and try to struggle with rent when I can pay their rent because they need to be able to leave the nest because by the time you die as a parent they have to be able to survive without you. You cannot raise a child who in their 30s still relies on you during summertime or during you know when school's off you know if they're in their mid 20s maybe there's some leeway here but people got to understand like eventually we have to figure it out without our parents and if you're in a position where you're disabled or dealing with um uh you know uh issues that stem from needing a caretaker you're in a different game like we're all in a different game but like you're in an even more different game and the problem is we all keep trying to compare each other's games but it's totally different our animes aren't the same our stories aren't the same they might look the same we might be similar and yes the prem the foundation of all of our stories to love and be loved is the same but how we go about it is going to be completely different which is why i think it's really hard when people try to appeal to their oppressors or appeal to other people to understand them when how how can they understand you you guys don't speak each other's language you know what I mean so one of the things I pride myself in is being able to understand people who can't speak English because I pride myself in being able to observe the human and it's because I think we're all animals evolved over time and I think we're intellectual beings mixed in with our primal desires and most humans communicate through their body so as long as you understand basic body language you should be able to understand most things now in different cultures different things can mean different things for sure I understand that but for some reason fundamentally the eyes are universal pain love hate anger Everything is in the eyes. And to me, even if you're blind, it's on your face. Even if I don't see your eyes, this part of your face, this this thing, the thing that makes up your face tells me everything. You know what I mean? So a person in a mask is the most scary thing to Brittany because I cannot read people's faces. I can't read people without their face. So when I do Skype calls on Patreon, highly recommend, would love to talk to you guys. Definitely one of my favorite things about my job. Um, is that I always ask to have video camera so I can see your facial expressions and I can watch your face. And so I think people, I think, I think it's easy for all of us to distrust each other, especially with the pandemic and how to keep safe and to distrust people's authenticity because there's a lot of inauthentic people in the world. But I think ultimately I'm hoping that my podcast and what I just said communicates to you why COVID for certain people is scary because we're wearing masks or because we don't look like each other anymore because people like me rely heavily on facial expressions to know if I'm in danger and the the reason I pay attention so much to facial expressions is because based off of what I've read about humans right babies too all of it is held in the face so I'm trying to use science to understand humans while trying to understand the spiritual side of human interaction which is your humanity who are you but that's your story. And that means I have to get to know you to trust you. Do you get what I'm saying? So first we have the physical element of trust, which is to be able to physically observe you and go, okay, this is not a threat to me. And then we have the emotional and spiritual connection of, okay, I know this is you know good for me. How many YouTubers do you know who have collabed together and you guys just assume we're all friends? I'm telling you right now, I've been inside the homes of YouTubers 
and I don't I couldn't tell you like their character like who they are I could tell you they were nice to me or not nice to me or how they interacted with me but I know nothing about them but they really believe um I have ideas but ultimately I've interacted with so many people that I don't really know but people think oh they're in a picture together they know each other that's why I know it is so easy to like even hate on Trump but I guarantee you that man has met a lot of people he probably doesn't even remember meeting and that's the problem with famous people is they're not living in our bubbles like even me the little bit of fame I've had or the little bit of famous people I've met it makes me realize like oh y'all are living a completely different game than I'm living and that's why I don't like going that's why it's so interesting to see these feminists that I used to hang out with even to temporarily even for a moment and realize like y'all are so different behind camera right and that's why I try so hard to be as authentic here because I'm not a I feel like I have a really good understanding of my existence I really trust myself that's why I'm happy to talk to any youtuber who wants to talk to have any of these conversations that's why I offer calls on patreon guys I literally offer calls you have beef with me great make an appointment pay for my time because obviously that's my job and talk to me I'm available right because I trust myself and therefore I trust my judgment of other people, especially now. Over, over my, in my 20s, like I trusted what I knew then, but obviously now I have more information. And remember that every time you go through life, you can make mistakes. I will probably trust somebody in the future that maybe was the wrong person to trust, but I'm not going to beat myself up over it and I'm going to use it as a lesson. So remember all of these, all of these things that are happening in society, all this distrust we feel, it stems with us. It has to start with us. There's just no way okay, that it ultimately doesn't come down to how we act towards other people. And if we all acted a little bit better, it would be a little bit better. And I know so many of you have so many reasons to hate people who look different from you. I get it. I'm just asking you to consider that your lived experience is limited and might need a retuning. And if it doesn't, if you're so well lived, then you'll understand this conversation and you shouldn't get mad about it. And that's the key. I'm not mad that I know Brittany has a lot more learning. And I hope you aren't either mad at yourself for knowing you have more to learn because that is the best and most significant part of our existence. As intellectual evolved animals is our willingness and openness open, openness to learning. And ultimately, recognize that the truth might not be what you thought it was going to be, but ultimately will always lead you to joy. Because what is true is often a relief to us. Because it's the best we can work with. You know what I mean? It really is. The truth is ultimately the best thing we can work with. Now, have fun, have, oh my God, I can't talk. Have fun searching for it because that part, that's life. And that's the hard part. That's where the struggle comes from. But it is so worth it in the end. It is so worth it. Guys, thank you so, so much for being here. Thank you for joining me. Um, I got to get going. This podcast is going up tomorrow, but in an hour, I'm going to do a live show on YouTube. If you guys are interested, I'm live every Tuesday, uh, switching between Patreon and YouTube. So if you guys are interested, please join me on those platforms and uh, remember to subscribe. 40% of you who watch me are not subscribed. So please, please, please subscribe. Let's make this podcast a thing. I'd really like it. Very excited for next week's episode. Please be here. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be crazy. It's all about identity and it's it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of changes. It's going to be really fun. I'm so excited to talk to you about it. Okay. Talk to you next week. Have a great day. Bye. Stuck in my head, in real life while in bed, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed, so why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking, yeah. Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Dun, da, da, da.